with the guiding of the Holy Spirit, he did a phenomenal job. Yeah. So you all are blessed to have Zach in your pulpit. And if you all will listen to him as God leads him to lead you, this church will do great things in Cynthia, Kentucky. Amen. But we've got to get away from the mindset that if we just invite people to come and listen to our pastor, to come, be a, to, come to our church and that's where they'll get discipled. That's where they'll hear the, hear the gospel message. Said that if I could just invite somebody to church, I've done my part. That's enough. Because that's not what the passage says here. Nowhere in here does it say to invite them to the gathering. It says to go unto all the nations and make disciples. That is a process. But I'm not here to talk about that process. I'm here to talk about the initial aspect of and it's something that we are equipped to do. I understand that, you know, it's hard to, to feel like you're equipped to disciple someone with scripture because you're not went to seminary or you've not had Bible uh, college. I get it. I understand it. But the first initial aspect of going and making disciples, we are all, if we are believers, are equipped to do. And that initial encounter with going and making disciples is simply sharing who Christ is and what he's done. It's the simple gospel message. What is the good news? And so that's what I'm here to talk about this morning. Luke several passages of scripture. I will skim through a lot of those. But uh, the other account uh, yeah, is Luke chapter 20 uh, verses 40. And we see the writer Luke says this about the same commands that uh, we had just discussed in Matthew's account. And he said to them, he being Jesus, thus it is written Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be to all the people from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. He gives the gospel message in a nutshell right there. Something that if you are a believer, you have experienced firsthand. That's why he concludes there that you are witnesses of these things. We could say that this was only directed towards the apostles. It was just the individuals that he was speaking to at the moment. But I would beg to differ to that. Because he says in, in Matthew that you will go to all the nations and those original twelve would not be able to do such. The mode of travel was on foot or by horseback. Very seldom did they use boats. Those were left for main shipments. You see in, in Paul, Paul that he jumps on one of those boats as a prisoner being transferred. Feel this command to go into all the world, to, to reach every nation. I beg to differ that this, but there's something here that I, I, I've seen in the reading of these two passages that it talks about, and I think this is very important for the gospel message. He says that uh, forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name. In Matthew 28, he says that you would baptize them in the name. So I want to discuss a little bit about that name. It's interesting that this name has been something that has been debated, that's been thrown to the side, that's been adulterated throughout history. It's been under attack for centuries. At the Council of Nicaea, if you know anything about biblical history and know anything about church history, there was a Arminian, or excuse me, Ar, uh, Arianism rose up. Arianism taught that the name, the person and work of Jesus Christ, was that he was a created being different than God the Father. 
The Council of Constantinople fought against the, the view of Apollinarianism, which is that Jesus didn't have human nature. The Council of Ephesus fought against Nestorianism. That, that was the idea that there was two separate natures and two separate wills all in one person. Two people in one body. It's kind of like the schizo Jesus, right? In the Council of Chalcedon, they uh, monophysitism was overrode the human nature. It doesn't stop there. We've got the same problem in our culture today. You've got the Muslim Jesus, that Jesus was just a prophet. He didn't die on the cross for your sins. How could a major prophet die? In such a horrible way. You've got the Mormon Jesus. That Jesus is just another God baby. And that all of us could be the same thing as Jesus. Another little God baby. You had the Jehovah's Witness Jesus. Created as an angelic being. The firstborn created angelic being. That came in the form of a man. And then you had the culture of Jesus. The word of faith movement. That deals with bringing. Position and making him more like man so that we could close the gap between humanity and deity. But I want to tell you that that's not the Jesus that we serve. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. That's right. Amen. So the idea of a name is the, the aspect of a, of a person or a thing that from, from the other thing or the other people. So what does the Bible from all the other views that we've just mentioned? What does the Bible say about who Jesus actually is? That's one of the first things I want to discuss this morning. It's the most important question. I've had several conversations. My wife can attest. I used to have Mormons come over my house every Monday night. And we would discuss things. Discuss the Trinity, which they don't hold to. We discussed their beliefs. I had a, uh, a Muslim friend that I worked with in juvenile corrections, and he and I talked about about I recently had a conversation with Jehovah's Witness sitting down at Starbucks and discussed with him who he, who he said he is, or who the Jehovah's Witness believe. But each one of them, I'll lead off with a question, much like Jesus did to his apostles in Matthew chapter 16. Who is it that people say that I am? Peter would reply, some people say John the Baptist. Some people say that you're one of the old prophets. And then Jesus would ask him, but who is it that you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but my father who is in heaven has revealed that to you. Right. Spiritually, it's very, very get who Jesus is correctly. Amen. Because he's the very one that died for our sins, which we'll get to in just a moment. There's a theological term that you all can now use because I'm about ready to share it with you of what we consider Jesus Christ and that is the hypostatic union. So when Zach gets back, you can tell him that you are now a theologian because you know this, <laughs> this term. Hypostatic union. What is the hypostatic union? The hypostatic union is the discussion of Christ. It's in Christology that he is fully God in nature and fully man in nature. Two in one man. So the fully man aspect of who Jesus is. Jesus shares in our limitations and our weaknesses. He had a soul of emotions. We see that in the triumphal entry. Um, John 12, 27. If you remember, um, 
He said that his, his soul had become troubled. You see again in by Judas in John 13, 21, that he became troubled in spirit. Also sorrowful. We see that when he was grieved unto death. We see him grieve over Lazarus. We also see that by other human beings, he marveled at the centurion's faith. You remember that story? We see that Jesus had a human mind. Luke 2.52 says that he increased in wisdom. Jesus learned. He learned how to eat. He learned how to walk. He learned how, how to obey his parents. Jesus learned obedience. Right. He's just as human as we are. Yeah. He's no different. Jesus had a human body. He became hungry. He became thirsty. He became tired. Remember when he was on the cross? He said, I thirst. You remember when uh, he was carrying his cross? They had he was too weak to carry it. His body got tired. Remember he sat down at the Samaritan well where he encountered the Samaritan woman and told her everything about her. He sat down there because he was tired. Tired of his travels. He became hungry during his temptation. As we discussed, he grew in stature and strength. And he was born of a woman, just like each one of us sitting here today. If you're in this world, you came that, that route. But there's something interesting about him being born of a woman because it was not just a normal birth. A virgin. And the necessity of the nurse virgin birth, the interesting aspect of that is that that's exactly what allowed the deity to come in the form of a man. Procreation didn't occur for, it to, for that to happen, for his birth to take place. If you go back and read in Luke chapter 2, and I'll turn there. I don't think I have that on the slides there. Um, we see the account of the virgin birth. Interesting. Bear with me as I find it here. Luke chapter 1. Gabriel, an angel, announces the Christ's miraculous birth in verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel went to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, whose name was Joseph of the descendant of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greeting at this statement, and kept pondering what kind of situation this was. The angel said to her, verse 30, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. And he will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. You shall call his name Jesus. Do you know the significance of the name Jesus? In Hebrew, the name Jesus simply means Yahweh saves. Jesus is the salvation, but it's interesting to point out. 
As I stated before, procreation didn't happen for Jesus to come into this world. That's very important. You'll want to hold on to that as we get further on into the message. Jesus was born of a virgin. His name was Jesus. That points to the fact that it's God himself that allows salvation to occur. Salvation is by no one but God himself. Right. Mary didn't do anything to, have to, to conceive the child. No other man was involved in conceiving the child. It was God himself by his spirit coming upon Mary that brought salvation to this world. There's nothing any man can do to cause salvation to occur. It's only by God. So the virgin birth, the necessity of that, it allows us to see his humanity because he was born of a woman. But it also allows us to see God's divine work. It allowed Jesus to be sinless. Jesus was not born with inherited sin or original sin. You might wonder what that is. Let's go to... Genesis chapter 3 for a moment. If you remember the account of Genesis chapter 3, that was when sin was introduced into humanity. In the dialogue that Eve had with the serpent, verse 6 says this, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the, to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Some interesting points in this, because this is the very moment that sin was birthed into humanity. Jesus, 100% human nature, did not have the aspect that every one of us have now and that is the entangling, the in, entwining of sin. We are not, there's nothing we could do to be apart from that sin nature. It is now part of our, in essence, spiritual DNA. Jesus was brought into this world in a miraculous manner that allowed him to bypass the passing down of original sin. That his nature, his human nature was not entwined. With the sinful nature. But there's some interesting things that I want to point out in this in this uh, falling away from God. We see that Eve looked at the tree and she saw that it was good for food. She seen that it was a delight to her eyes and it had the ability to make one wise. What's the importance of that? Was it Necessarily just her eating from the fruit of the tree that brought sin into the world? Or was it something else? Because I believe that it's wrapped up in those three things. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1, you see time and time again at each day, God, after his creation, saw that it was good. On the sixth day after he created man, he saw that it was very good. God declared what is good and what is evil. Amen. As from the beginning. But what we have here with Eve is that she is now deciding for herself. It was the tree that God told them not to eat from. It was pleasing to the eye. She saw that it was good. Give her Going on in the world today. Man is deciding for themselves what is good. That's why you have the riots that are going on. They're deciding for themselves what is good and what is evil. That's why you have such a, a strong push for transgender, the LGBTQ community, because they're choosing for themselves what is good. Sad to say that they're using the most quoted scripture as justification for them, for their choice of what is good and what is evil. For God so loved the world. God is love. If God loved 
this. He wants what's best for me, right? Well, yeah, he does want what's best for you. And sin ain't it. That's right. But man is deciding for himself what is sin and what is not. They've diminished sin to nothing more that if you are coming against their agenda, coming against their ideologies, that that's sinful. We see Psalm 51 on how this original sin is passed down. He said, David says, that he was conceived in sin. Paul puts in the aspect of uh, federal headship, another term that you all could use to show that you're theologians now. Romans 5, 17, for by transgression of the one, death reigned through the one. Because of Adam and his decision to choose for himself by way of his wife transgression has passed from generation to generation to generation bringing wickedness our daily but Jesus is different he passed by by the decree of God to, to come in the form of a man passing the passing down of original sin he didn't inherit the legal guilt and moral corruption it doesn't belong to him it says that he's a holy child holy meaning set apart he's different and there's a significance on different why he was set apart. You might wonder, well, how do we know that he was truly sinless? How do we know that Jesus didn't inherit original sin? Well, let's look what the Bible says. Jesus claimed it. John 8, 29, said, he says this. Jesus saying, and he who sent me, he being God, is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Amen. The always do things is in the present active. It's the same thing as saying that he's continuously doing or in a constant state of being doing what is pleasing to the Father. Every step, every breath, every action, every word that he spoke was always pleasing to the Father. That's his own claim, right? Well, others confirmed it. What about Pilate? When Jesus was being tried, he said, I find no crime in him. Peter says it in 1 Peter 1.19 that he was a lamb without spot or blemish. Oh yeah, but these, you know, Pilate was, he's somebody who's uh, indifferent. He didn't have anything against Jesus. Peter, he was one of his followers. What about the Sanhedrin? They were enemies. They despised Jesus. John 8, 46, he's in a dialogue with them talking about who their father is. And he says their father is the devil. But he says, which one of you convicts me of sin? And they all remained silent. They couldn't bring any charge of sinfulness against Christ. He lived an exemplary life from the eyes of every individual who laid their eyes on him. Couldn't see sin in him. More than that, the Father confirmed it. If you remember in Matthew 3 17, when Jesus was being baptized, everyone heard a loud voice coming from heaven that said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Or some people thought that it was thunder. But God Himself confirmed that He was well pleased. Unless he was sinless. 
So what's the importance of Jesus being sinless? Well, that brings us to the message. The message that we preach. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that he, being God, made him, being Jesus, who knew sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There's the importance of Jesus right. being sinless. God the Father found pleasure for the Son, born of a virgin, thereby bringing about sin in his very nature, and then pouring out his wrath upon him. Yeah. That's a father who cares. Jesus had to be fully man, fully human, to identify with us, right? He had to be fully human because if if he wasn't, we would have, well, you don't know what it's like, God. You don't know what it's like. You don't know the struggle that I go through every single day. When the temptations come my way, it's so hard to keep from falling into the temptation. It's on every side. I'm oppressed. Pull out our victim card every time. But we've got a Savior who identifies, who went through life just as we do. Remember Hebrews 4.15? For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. He was tempted to Way that we, the same way that we are. He, he fought through it. Accomplishing something we cannot accomplish. But experiencing the same things that we do. Jesus had to be fully divine. To be without sin. To substitutionally atone for our sins. He had to be fully divine. So he could we might become the righteousness of God. He took on the sin of the world for the purpose for us to be the righteousness of God. Jesus's, or Jesus experienced the consequences of sin even though he never experienced sin himself. This is highly important. Don't miss this. He experienced the thirst. He experienced his pain and death. Garden of Gethsemane just before he was captured and crucified and died. The, 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 the passage of scripture says that he sweat drops of blood. You remember that passage? A lot of people will say that, oh well, you know, Jesus and he was going to be scourged and beaten and spit upon. I think that that's what. I think that he knew what that was going to be like. I think that he lived that his entire life in his omniscience. He understood that he understood to the degree of what pain was. The only thing that Jesus had never experienced throughout the 33 years of his life was separation from the Father. That's right. He continually lived doing what was pleasing unto the Father. He and the Father are one. He never experienced separation from the Father. But he knew at this moment, when he took on the sin of the world, because remember, he was sinless. When he took on the sin of the world as if he had sinned himself, he could no longer be one with the Father in that moment. Because God is holy, set apart, Set aside from sinfulness. And so Jesus had to experience separation from the Father in that moment when he took on the world's sin. That is why he said, let this cup pass from me. If there be any other way to redeem humanity unto ourselves, let this cup pass from me. 
I don't know what, could you imagine the fear being, it's hard for us to understand this because we are sinful. We have, we were born, we were already separate from the father. We don't know what it's like to be in the presence of God. Could you imagine? Think about Isaiah. When he stood before the presence of God. Think about it. He became undone in the presence of God. undone we cannot stand in the father so we don't know what it's like oh but how easy we live in darkness how easy we run back even though we've been exposed how easy we run back to the darkness because it's a place of comfort it's what we're used to but Jesus, he didn't know anything about the darkness. Never experienced it. Never experienced separation from the Father. He was one with the Father. That would be a stressful situation, wouldn't it? Luke 24, as we read a few moments ago, we see that Christ would suffer and rise again from the third, from the dead on the third day. That he would suffer the anguish of being separated from the Father, on top of the pain that he had to be dealt. And all of that, so that we could have the repentance for forgiveness of sin. So what is this repentance for forgiveness? Because it almost seems like the point that you agree with what God says is good and what God says is evil. That you in your don't want what sin has to offer. I don't want my sin any longer. I, I hate it. I despise it. And you embrace and you cling. And what God has to offer, that's repentance. Amen. And out of that are your out of that you do good works. Therefore, if any new creature, the old the come, that's salvation. It's a change. In nature, we see the Apostle Paul struggle with this a little bit in Romans chapter seven. If you remember, he talks about how uh, that he always did the things that he didn't want to do, and he didn't do the things that he wanted to do, and he calls himself a wretched man. He was struggling with this because he knew he was a new creature, a new new creation, new creature. He now had righteous nature. In dwelling in him by the Holy Spirit's presence. And there was this constant war with that sinful nature battling within him every day because he wanted to live a life completely righteous. He abhorred sin, he hated it. But yet he found himself struggling with it all day long. That's how you know you're saved. If you hate sin and you find when you do it, it breaks you apart. That's true salvation. It's all well and good to go out and say, yeah, come to my church. It's all well and good to say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. There was a big movement back in the early 2000s of the Jesus is my homeboy. You had celebrities of all walks in life wearing the, the apparel the hats, the t-shirts. That diminishes the Christ that we have. If he's just your homeboy, 
there's a problem. Yeah. He is our God. Amen. He is the one who came in the flesh, suffered as we suffered, and died for the remission of our sin. If that doesn't deserve reverence, I don't know what does. But we've lost reverence. We've lost the reverence for who Christ is. And that's what I want to draw us back to. We no longer agree with the sin nature, although it still exists. We now live for what God says is good and evil. Philippians 2, 5 through 11 says this. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant or a slave, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient even to the point of death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of those who are those who are on, on the earth and those who are under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In that verse, the stretch of verses there, six verses, that every everyone will confess the work that Jesus Christ had accomplished is so good that He will get the glory. Be by your submissive will. And saying, you know what? No longer what I desire, what he desires. Or in judgment. He will get the glory. I hope that the message some ammunition that you can take to the streets, to your workplace, that now you have a greater understanding of the work that was accomplished by Jesus Christ, who he is, so you can combat all these other false Jesuses that are out there. Amen. Because it's not good enough. It's not worthy enough to just invite people to church. Give them the gospel. Here, um, I'm sure there's several of you that are, are equipped, but I will be here if you'd like to talk. Um, I don't know everybody's situation. I don't know where you are spiritually. I don't know if you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but if that's something you desire this morning, if conviction is brought to your doorstep, then I'll be here to talk with you. Um, yeah, if y'all go ahead and
tie that uh, we close out with offering. Worship be our Lord through our stewardship. Bo, is that correct? Yeah. If you would uh, pray over this offering for us, be God. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for everybody coming to pray for God. Thank you, Pete and Rob, for coming and praying for us. Thank you for my family, the church, and everybody. Amen. 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 Thanks, buddy. Yes, sir. We will be singing page one during offertory, so if you would like to open up your hymn books, if you see one there, feel free to do so. It is holy, holy, holy.
for each one of your children. And I just ask, Lord, that uh, you would be a, a blessing in his life and that he would recognize from where his help comes from. Of course, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yes, sir? Oh, yeah. I'll take care of that here if you just want to set them on. But we do need to pray for the uh, dinner that's going to be next, to, next door. Um, <laughs> I hope everybody is more than willing to stick around and stay. Um, yeah, all right. Uh, do we have someone that would like to lead in, in uh, prayer over our dinner? All right, Miss Heather. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for this ministry, and thank you for all the people that has come. May they be a blessing in your sight. I want to bless this meal and let it be nourishment to each and every person here. In Jesus' loving name, amen. 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 Thank you. And if you all do it. Feel free to just uh, scoot right on over back there. Make sure you shake Brother Rob's hand or, you know, give him no.